So just a, a quick little video, a minute or so of seeing what it's like from riding a motorcycle at that, at that pace. And there's a lot going on, uh, uh, obviously, when the motorcycle is going that quick. And today's talk, for the next 30 minutes, I'll get into why riding a motorcycle like that can work in the rest of your life, how that, the things that we do to mitigate risk will work in the, in the rest of your life. So, before I get into the introduction to myself, so why, why is motorcycle racing important? And why do we look at the, these habits and these techniques of what the best riders in the world do? And sports, all sports have three aspects. They have the physical aspect. They have the mental aspect. Well, there's also a lot of sports that have a mechanical aspect as well. So when you look at, for instance, we take volleyball. Right? So volleyball is um, it's very physical. And it's mental, but there's really no mechanical part of, of, of it with, uh, with that sport. And then we take something like car racing. Car racing is very mental and also it's mechanical, but it's really not all that physical. What I mean physical is physical being that your body movements, what you do, right, changes what the sport does. And in car racing, right, you're not moving your body around. And when you get to the upper levels of car racing, Formula One, Formula 3000, some of the forces are the same as they are on motorcycles. So motorcycles has all of those, all of those factors of that sport. So it has the mental side, the physical side, and the mechanical side. But there's one other aspect of our sport that, that also is a, is, is a factor, which is the risk. So, here on a motorcycle, right, you, you can fall down at pretty much any time. And of course, what we're trying to do is to, is to mitigate that. So by having or looking at what the best riders in the world are doing on the bike and off the bike, and if you can put those in the rest of your life, even to some of these small little things, that's what's going to make you successful in all these aspects. And we, one of the things that we talk about is how you do anything is how you do everything. And we're looking at what these professional guys, what these guys do. And these guys are riding uh, at, at incredible rates. And the competition is so incredible. And here we, we can look at golfing or we can look at you know, basketball. We see all the, how the scores are and how close everything is. I'll give you an idea in motorcycle racing, the last MotoGP race. Uh, last MotoGP race a couple weeks ago, the race time was 42 minutes and 6 seconds. So 2,000. 527 seconds, the race was won by less than nine tenths of a second. So when you look at the math, you do the math of that, right? So here they did 42 minutes, right? Less than three one hundredths of a percent difference between these riders. So think about these riders riding for 42 minutes, and they're literally at that point on those motorcycles, ice skating around, because that's how these, these bikes are. They're so powerful, that they're so fast. And to give you an idea for people that aren't into motorcycles or aren't into motorsports, motorcycles, um, from a, from a, um, a, a performance standpoint, so everybody's into the fancy cars and all that stuff, there isn't a faster production vehicle other than a motorcycle. BMW 1000, for instance, we'll use that. Dan's got one. BMW 1000, from zero to 145 miles an hour. There isn't, you, can, you can go down, buy one for 15,000 bucks, and there isn't anything that will outperform it zero to 145 miles an hour, period. Bugatti, Veyron, any of those things. It doesn't even come close. So the performance aspect of these things is just absolutely incredible. So what these athletes are doing at the highest levels 
and they're, they're essentially riding these bikes on very small contact patches of rubber and being able to not fall down, that's again, taking these habits and the techniques that they're doing to be able to do that. So one of our local tracks, Thunder Hill, front straightaway speed, Dan's bike for instance, about 180 miles an hour, he's going 276 feet a second. So you think about what your thought process has to happen at 276 feet a second. And then you think about average speeds, at average speed at that MotoGP race, they were about 185 feet a second. So average. So think about how your thought process has to work and, and what they're trying to do to mitigate that. And what I want to be able to do is, I'll give you some of these best practices and we'll go through them and be able to see if we can put some of these in your own world and see if you can get a little bit of edge with some of the things that you're doing and all the other aspects of, of your life. And what it boils down to is these riders have basic fundamentals. And what they're trying to do is have perfect execution of these fundamentals under pressure. It's everybody can practice or train. You see guys a lot of do that, but it's what they do on Sunday afternoon in front of 100,000 people that really puts it into play. So that's what the top riders are gonna do and that's, that's, how, we're gonna, that's how we'll take a look at it. Races are one. Uh, I know one of the things that, that uh, people look at, but they may not give enough uh, uh, thought to is it really is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Rider that wins a race, he, right, he's not the rider that sets the one single fast lap, he's the rider that sets the most fastest laps over the race. The rider that wins the championship is the rider that sets the most fastest laps over the whole year. That's the rider that wins the championship. So you gotta think about it in a little bit in the long term and what some of these things are, and you have to look at your short-term goals versus your long-term goals, which we'll get into it uh, as well. And really what it boils down to is the fundamentals and how well you're doing the fundamentals. Motorcycling, there's, the fundamentals of riding, it's actually not that difficult. It's got two wheels, a throttle, and a brake, and you go ride. And that's something that we get, people get really confused about is they all think that there's some sort of a silver bullet for all of these things, and there's not. Those people that are at the top levels, they're just better at the fundamentals than everybody else. That's it, they're better at perfecting the fundamentals. So, I'm gonna give a little bit of introduction to myself, and I think having an introduction is good. And I think that when you look at people that are in your, your own space, whether you're a manager, individual contributor uh, with the company, is hearing stories and being able to look at individualism is a pretty big deal. And because one of the things that we pride ourselves on and, and how I teach and the schools that I teach is our curriculums, the, the curriculums are set for the student, not the teacher. A lot of times we see curriculums that are set for the teacher, not the student. So we want to be able to conform to what the student's needs are. So hearing their stories and being able to relate to them ends up being a pretty big deal. So that's one of the things that if people come ride with me, and these guys, a couple people, three people in this room have ridden with me before, is we find out what they do for a living and, and what some of their backstory is. So my story is one, um, my name's Ken Hill, and uh, I ride motorcycles for a living. And typically when people hear that, they, I have three kids, and they'll say, you, you know, you've got kids and a mortgage, you're, you're, you're nuts, right? You're a complete risk taker. And the funny part is, is I work at mitigating risk probably more than every single person in this room. I want to go quicker. So when I go to a track day, a race day, the riders that I coach, I'll get into that in just a second, the riders that I coach, uh, very, very fast. I have to ride with these riders. So I have to ride with some of these guys that, that have won national championships and they're top in their field. But I also have to pay my mortgage to put my kids through college. So working at mitigating risk, that's really what we're looking at. So I got started in the sport pretty late, 30 years old. I, uh, didn't, I was in the car business, spent 20 some odd years in the car business, managing parts and service departments in the dealerships. And so I uh, spent 20 years, uh, 20 plus years doing that. And of course now I, that was a 40 hour a week job, kind of. Uh, and now I work you know, 80 hours a week to not work 40 hours a week. But I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with that. So I got started in the sport very late. I didn't have a lot of natural talent in this sport. Uh, I wanted to do it because I wanted to race cars, couldn't afford to race cars, so I thought I'll do something cheap, I'll do ride motorcycles. And when I got into it, because I didn't have a lot of background, I, I didn't have any talent, right? I didn't, have any, I didn't have any of these things. So I had to build technique. So I became very studious of our sport. And 
I realized that if I want to get good, uh, I have to study it because I didn't have that background. So I became very technique based in our sport. I, I just didn't because I didn't have anything else to fall on other than technique. So as I studied the sport, and I realized at that time that there wasn't a lot of information out there that put things in a very simple way, right? A lot of, just a lot of chatter that was out there. And I went through and, and I decoded it in my own language. And as I got better in the sports, um, I won local championships. Um, I did my first professional race at age 41. I held a professional license at age, up till age 43. It was top 10 in the nation at that point at age 41. Uh, so I was able to ride at a very high level. And through that, people asked me, well, gosh, you know, you're riding and you're kind of an older dude. Uh, you know, what can we do to, uh, you know, what can I do in my riding? And it was through that that I developed sort of my own language with this sport and have been able to communicate it, and it's my full-time profession. So my riders, to give you an idea of where I'm at with it, so my riders, I have, uh, I have three riders um, that have all won national championships, so best riders in the United States. Um, 2017, my riders has, have 59 podiums um, in national competition, as well as podiums with regional riders as well. And what we, what we look at with our riders is, again, we take one of their, each one of their individual, individual um, attributes, and we look at these things. We find out what's holding them back in their riding, and we look at their fundamentals, we build their fundamentals. The things that I work on and with these guys here that I've ridden with, with the riders that I work with on a national level, no different. The language is the same. The technique is the same, just the degree of application changes. And I think that that's something that's really important when you look at fundamental, when you build fundamentals. It's one, identifying what the right fundamentals are, and then through that, making those fundamentals um, more precise. So, that, that, I really, that's really the introduction I just wanted to give you. I didn't want to make it, uh, make it uh, uh, too long and realize that, um, that my riders, um, we want to give them a way to continually get better. And we want, we want to give them a way that allows them to grow. And we look at that through, again, fundamental building and what's holding them back. And there's some cool things in here that we're going to talk about with our best practices. So I'm just going to jump right into some best practices. Because that's kind of what everybody wants to know, is like, what are some of these things that these riders are doing? What are some of these things that uh, uh, these guys are doing on the bike and off the bike to make them better riders, to make them better people? So I'm just going to jump right into that. And the first thing I'm going to do is, is, if you can today, is give yourself permission to learn something. I know it sounds silly. Give yourself permission to learn something. And I've been to a lot of different talks. I've heard a lot of you know, people present. And it, it almost comes off to where it's, it's sort of beyond you. But if you start to read between the lines, um, give yourself permission to put this in your world. I'm not going to leave my world, but you see how these things put them into your world and see how those things fit. So you can give yourself permission to that. So first best practice that I want to talk about, the first thing that we look at with our riders is something that you may not have thought about. But realize that there's three aspects of an athlete. And motorcycle riders, motorcycle racers, whether you like it or not, you guys are athletes. And if you can start to look at yourself on that and where you're, you know, are you at in your job performance, you can almost start thinking of yourself as right, a corporate athlete or somebody that has to perform at a high level. Because I know every single person in this room is asked to put out as much as they possibly can all the time. So the three aspects of an athlete or one, it's your technique and your craft. It's what you do. It's all the things that you do through the day, right? Every, all, all of, all of, the, all the, the, the discipline that you've learned, the education that you've got, right? That's the number one thing. Well, the second aspect of an athlete is their physical fitness. So the more physically fit they are, the longer they can access their technique. So as soon as your fitness drops, right? If you're out, out in a, a motorcycle race, or whether you're a cyclist or whatever it may be, right? as soon as your fitness drops, you lose the ability to access your technique. You're not going to be able to access your technique at a high level. The third aspect of an athlete is your mental fitness. And this is one that I, I would say on my national weekends, my Motor America weekends, where I'm working with riders, it's the number one thing I work on is their mental fitness. Because they've done all the hard work 
at that point. They're, they're there, right? They've qualified or whatever it is. But now, how fit they are mentally, that, that's actually the tough one. And the better your mental fitness is, the more you're going to be able to access your technique as well. So if your mental, if, if your mental fitness isn't there for whatever reason, right, you, you wake up one morning and uh, you get some bad news or you know, whatever, you got a flat tire, right, whatever, whatever the issue is, and now your mental fitness is blocked, you're not going to be able to access your technique. I've got a great peer group that I work with. Peer group, uh, the nice thing about this peer group is, is uh, these are all people that have come together through motorcycles. And the peer group that I work with, um, I've got some people that in, in, in high academics. Um, I have the number one tactical trainer uh, in the country as part of my group. Uh, and then also I've got um, a person that's a Top Gun fighter pilot. And they work so much on the mental aspect of what they do. Because you need to be able to access that information on demand. So it's being able to compartmentalize what you're doing, your technique, your craft, and being able to be able to access it whenever you want to be able to access it. Because there's times where you're not, you may not have a choice. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So the three aspects of an athlete, your technique, your craft, what you do, your physical fitness, the fitter you are, the longer you can access this information. So it's, I can guarantee you, and guys here that, that well, anybody that's done any type of sports, right? As soon as your fitness drops off, what happens? Your focus drops off. It's gone. So that's why we work at being very, very fit uh, in our sport. And then the other ones we work on is our mental fitness. We do a lot of things with our mental fitness, whether it's uh, we do a lot of visualiz visualization, uh, we do a lot of yoga, we do a lot of neuroscience work as well. Uh, we've got some pretty cool companies that are on our side that work with, on the, neuro, the neuroscience part of it. So three aspects of an athlete. Man, it's, it's, that's trying to be the complete athlete is really what we're looking for. So second best practice that I want to talk about. And this is an interesting one because for people that don't ride motorcycles uh, or don't, don't, are not into the sport, it's why do we fall down? Why do we fall down on a motorcycle, right? So there's really five reasons why you crash a motorcycle. And when I mean five reasons why we, we, me, any of these other people that ride, it's why we crash, the things that we do in the motorcycle to make it uh, not stay upright. There's lightning strike crashes for sure, right? Where somebody may hit you, you may have a mechanical issue, whether there's, you know, somebody put oil on the track or whatever it is, there's those things as well. But the five reasons why we crash our motorcycles, the five reasons why we do something wrong. And the first one is lack of focus or lack of a plan. Lack of focus or lack of a plan. Not being in the moment. Not being, not being deliberate is what it boils down to. And typically at these speeds, I, I gave you some of those numbers, how fast we go on these, some of these bikes. Man, you just, you just don't have the time. So not being in the moment, not being present to make that happen, it, it, it literally is the number one reason why we're going to have issues. And we'll talk about some of the triggers that, that allow that to happen, uh, that, that put your brain into gear. Second one, abrupt inputs. The faster you go, the more lean angle you have to use. So the smoother all of your inputs have to be. So abrupt inputs. So you think about, I have to be super aggressive to go fast on a motorcycle. It's completely the opposite. So to go very, very quick, you actually have to be incredibly smooth and very precise with every input on the motorcycle, whether it's your brake or your throttle or your body movement. Everything has to be just absolutely incredibly smooth. So we have to work on being smoother on all of our inputs. Third reason why we crash is what we call is rushing direction. What direction means is on a motorcycle, the quickest way around a racetrack on a motorcycle is to be able to hold the throttle wide open the longest. So the person that can hold the throttle the wide open the longest is basically going to be accelerating the most. So the corners unfortunately kind of get in the way of that. So we have to learn to how to place our motorcycle on the entry to get a better exit. If we rush that placement, if we rush bike placement, if we rush where that spot is, that's, that's the third reason why we crash, right? You're actually putting the wrong thing at the wrong time. So rushing direction. Fourth one's repeating a mistake. 
we have very deliberate report cards in our riding. And these report cards tell us how we're doing. So if there's a track with 10 turns, we literally have 10 opportunities a lap to tell us how we're doing. And, that, and whether, that's with, whether that's with the direction of the motorcycle, whether that's what control we're using, whether we're doing, we, we have these report cards available to us. And the last reason why we crash uh, is, is, is funny because the ones that I would say are the most are one and this one. So one is lack of focus, lack of a plan. This one's overconfidence. Everything's working so great that you can do no wrong and that's when not good things happen. So overconfidence. So how do these relate to you and your, and your job and your, and your regular work day? So, if you're, going to come to your, if you're going to come to work, right, we want to be success-based. We, we, we don't want to be failure-based, right? So think about if you come to work, I would imagine you've got a plan for your day, whether you're an whether you're, uh, in, uh, individual or you're a manager, right? You're going to have some sort of plan for the day. There's th nothing worse than obviously going through your day without some sort of a plan for what you're doing. Whether you're, you know, wh wh what that is is you've got to be able to set your own expectation as well as your employee's expectation as well. So lack of focus, lack of a plan. Second one, abrupt inputs. And what abrupt inputs simply means, and this really works well with the third one, is rushing into a situation without having full knowledge of what you're doing or not having all that information available to you. So abrupt inputs. Think about what we think about on our motorcycle is the first 5% of our inputs and the last 5% of our inputs. Because the first 5% is what sets you up for the upcoming situation. The last 5% gives you the fine direction for that situation. So the middle 90% is completely adjustable based on whatever the situation may be. But if you start your processes, you start your job, you start whatever your project is, you think about the first 5% of your project, so you're in a position to adjust for the rest of it, help you out a lot. Same thing with the last 5%. So same thing with rushing direction. We talked a little bit about that, rushing direction, which is constantly thinking about what direction you're going and how you're getting there. We're gonna, we're gonna work on that one a little bit more. Repeating a mistake. Fourth reason why we crash is repeating a mistake, right? You think about, you know, one of the things that the Special Forces guys talk about is <clears throat> once a mistake is twice as a habit. So think about it that way. And uh, give you a quick story on that, that uh, some of these Special Forces guys, depending on what group they're in, uh, is they have to qualify for their shooting once a quarter. So they have to qualify. They go into a room similar to this, and they have to shoot a certain thing. And they don't know what it is. They're told, hey, they got to shoot this, this, or this. So <clears throat> if they miss once, they miss once, they're basically on probation. They get doc pay. They miss twice, they got to find a new job. So, of course, we don't have those kind of qualifications, you know, here in this type of environment. Their, their, uh, uh, their degree of application is a little bit different, but to give you an idea of why we're taking a look at re about repeating a mistake. So repeating a mistake, we start doing them over and over again. It's absolutely a habit, and we want to be able to fix those things. And the last one's overconfidence. The reason you feel confident is because of all the things you did right. So if we can work on, okay, got to fight that emotion and work on that technique that got you there. So technical versus emotional. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well and what a big deal that ends up being. So that's the five reasons why you crash. And you can think about how that relates to you and even in your job every day. These are something, that's something that I think about just in my own life every day, five reasons why I crash. So next one that I want to talk about is a different way of thinking. And you can, you can think, OK, how, how, does, how, does, how, how do we get focus? How do we get our technique engaged? And where that comes from is our eyes. So if your eyes are engaged, your technique is engaged. Think about that, right? So if you're looking at your situation, you want to see what's going on, our eyes have to be engaged. More importantly than that, on our motorcycle, is our eyes have got to be able to scan. So if your eyes are fixed, you'll lose perspective of where you're going or where you're at. 
So it's no different than, than you know, you can, take your, you can take whatever your job is or whatever project you're working on, right? If you're just so focused on this picture here in front of you, you lose perspective of what's out there. Just as if you're only, you're only worried about that, you're going to lose the fine detail right here. You've got to do both. So you've got to be able to think about what is it going to take to get my eyes engaged so I see both those things. And that's what we do is we have our eyes to scan, or eyes scan back and forth. And in motorcycles, we've got very specific triggers for that as we decelerate, our eyes move in, as we accelerate, our eyes move out. So think about how we get our eyes engaged and, and what are your, do you, do you have reference points for your days? Do you have reference points for how you're doing? Establishing some reference points. The motorcycle, we have five established reference points for every corner. There's all this stuff going on, right? You see a ton of things in your peripheral vision. But with our motorcycle, we have five established reference points. We look at our exit apex, our entry apex, our slowest point of the corner, um, our turning point, and where we go to the brakes. So that's it, five. So yes, there's all these other peripheral things that are going on, but we're only focused on those five points. And within those five points, we're only focused on one single vital point for every corner. Because if you hit one single vital point for every corner, the rest of them will take care of themselves. So it's identifying one, what are, the, what are those reference points? And then the second one is identifying what the most vital one is. Find that, out in your, find that out in your own deal, right? Find that out in your own jobs. Find that out what is, what is your most critical reference point? What are your reference points? What is, what is my end goal? What is my short-term goal? And how are my eyes doing to connect those? If I'm at my entry apex, I'm going to look out to my exit apex, and I want to make sure that my trajectory is straight. So using your eyes and your ability to line those things up and keep those continually moving, it, it just helps bring, bring things together. So that's, that's what we want to look at. And you can ask yourself, one of the trigger words that I have for myself is I ask myself, how am I doing? How am I doing? What are my report cards for that? So again, give yourself some report cards, whether it's for the hour, whether it's for the day. Know how you're doing. Establish those things for the day. Something that we do also with, with um, motorcycles, that's a little bit different. Uh, we do it with some of the car instruction as well. I do some car instruction as well. Is we draw the track backwards. So in other words, we draw the corner backwards. We draw the situation backwards. Because the reason we want to do this, we know where we want to end up, right? We want to end up out there. But we want to get there the most efficiently way that we can. So we'll draw the corner backwards. And one of the things that I said to you is what lasts longest on a motorcycle, which is acceleration. So I'm trying to put my acceler ex acceleration zone as early as possible because I know that's, what's la that's what lasts longest. So again, thinking about it in your deals, if you're working on 10 different things at once, probably a lot more than that, but if you're working on 10 things at once and four or five of them really aren't that important, right? You, you can concentrate on the things that do make a difference, right? Those bigger vital points that make a bigger part of that picture. Yeah, you still got to address some of those smaller points, but which ones make the biggest difference for the longest period of time? So we draw the track backwards to be able to do that. We want to know where we're going to end up and what our end goal is, and everything adjusts to that. We also look at our sport a little bit differently, and we look at our sport as time. We look at it as at feet per second. We don't look at it as speed. And the reason that that is important is the faster you go, the less time you have available. So if you have less time available, you have to be able to adjust for that. So it all goes back to your initial inputs, like I was talking about, how you're able to adjust those things. So the faster you go, the less time you have available, and you have to be able to adjust for those things. So how are you able to adjust and how are you able to put those things into play? So something to think about uh, when it comes to feet per second and time and, and how we draw things backwards. So all right, so I want to talk about, uh, this is kind of a fun one, and this is, this is one that we've messed around with uh, quite a bit, which is a proactive versus reactive thinking process. Proactive versus reactive. And realize that your training for proactive and reactive is actually the same. It's the same thing. 
being that, and I can take it a quick example, right? Two times two. Four jump into your head, right? Now if I go seven times nine, did it take a millisecond longer for that to jump into your head? Right, because you haven't trained for that one as much, though the process is identical. So proactive decision-making process is having the time available to make a decision. That's really what we all want, right? A proactive, right? I want to have time available to make the best educated decision for the situation that's happening in front of me. Of course, how do we see that? With our eyes, right? We talked about that as well, being able to see the situation sooner. So proactive is seeing the situation early, using all the data that's in front of you and be able to make the best educated guess for that that's based on your training. So what's a reactive decision-making process? Reactive is not having the time available to make a decision and you have to default to your training. Remember, you're going to, you're, you're going to default to whatever your highest level of training is. That's what it boils down to. So whatever your highest level of training is, that's what you're going to default to. So that's why we look at what are all of our risks, and that's the things that we train for. If my motorcycle's starting to slide, I want to have something in my tank, something in my toolbox that allows me to adjust for that. Or uh, my brakes start to fade. I want to have something available to be able to adjust for that, whatever the different situation is. So proactive thought process versus a reactive thought process. The training's identical. It's just being able to understand how you're going to mitigate those risks, understanding what those risks are and training for them. So one thing that tags along with that, and I think that this is something that whether you're an ind individual here, or whether you're a manager here, something that works, is you realize focus is actually super easy to get. Focus is great. Focus is easy. You get to work in the morning like, dude, I am going to jump on that and I am good. And then whatever happens, Somebody comes by, drops a load of stuff on your desk, and then now you're completely unfocused. Focus is very easy. It's the refocus that's the hard part. So what we work on, and again, motorcycle racing, you know, you saw a little bit in that video, you come up on a rider and you're inches apart, you know, going 100 and some odd miles an hour, and he makes a, a, a little bobble, something happens, and you lose your train of thought. So we work on having trigger words or trigger responses to put us back in the moment. Focus is easy. So is my, my focus trigger is when I roll out of hot pits, I stand up on my foot pegs, I sit back down, I am focused, I'm in the moment. I am, I am only worried about my task at hand. That's it. We have other riders, I have other riders that wiggle their fingers. Uh, Valentino Rossi, nine time world champion, goes up to his motorcycle, leans next to it, right? Stands next to his foot peg, puts his, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how much time is available, He's going to be a professional. Professionals are predictable, right? They're predictable because they want to take the same fundamental and make it more fine. So that's what Rossi's going to be able to do. So he's putting his plan into play. He's being focused. Refocus is the tough one. So finding a refocus word, finding a refocus trigger to put you back in the game, that's what we're, that, that, that is really the secret sauce when it comes to a lot of these things. Um, I spend a lot of time, uh, I do yoga, I do Bikram yoga, because of course I wanted the most difficult, gross, nasty one that I could, I could do, so I do Bikram. And I found out that when my eyes weren't engaged, guess what? I'd fall out, I'd fall out of my pose. So I worked really hard on, on my, my initial focus, and then I worked hard on my refocus. And as soon as I feel myself slipping out of a pose, right, something's, something's not right, then I have a re-trigger word. My re-trigger word's eyes. As soon as my eyes are engaged, guess what? It goes back to what I said. Your focus is engaged. Your technique is engaged. So my, my refocus word is eyes. Even if it's just jumping my eyes up, even on the racetrack, if something happens, I jump my eyes to the next reference point so that gets my, focus, that gets my technique re-engaged. So proactive and reactive thought processes. Give you a little something on that. And then also the, the, the focus and refocus. So some, some pretty good things on that one. So I have one last one, and we'll do a, a little bit of a, a Q&A, and then I have something that I want to um, talk to everybody about just, just for, real quickly. This is one that, that I've used for years, whether it was I was in the car business, um, whether I use it with my riders. And we do downloads quite a bit with our riders. 
because uh, we actually get very little time to ride. Um, and this is why we do so many things off the motorcycle to think about, because riding, Dan, how many times have you ridden this year? Seven weekends, six, six weekends, right? So when you think about that, how much time and effort he's got to invest in the sport, he actually gets very little time to do it. Tracks are crazy expensive. The bikes, everything's expensive to do it. So you have to consolidate your time. So this is why we spend a lot of time off the bike thinking about all the different things that we're due so we can go and um, not waste time when we're there at the track. So what we work on, and this is something that, that managers, this is a big deal. You can ask your employees, we ask them is what's holding you back? What's holding you back the most? So the rider might come in, right? The rider comes in and what ends up happening, the crew chief runs over, um, he's got his clipboard there, uh, the data guy comes over his laptop, they're downloading all the data out of the bike, and you know, their job is to essentially find something wrong, right? What's wrong? We want to make you better. We want your lap time to get better. We want to beat everybody else. And so <clears throat> there's so much information out there. So we go through our download sheet. We do it every time that we go out with our, when we ride. And out of all the things we go through, at the very end of it, we ask our rider, what's the one single thing that's holding you back the most? And there's times the rider may say, and this, this happens more often than not, the rider will say, it's me. I'm not focused. I, I'm, not, I'm not doing a good job. Don't touch the bike. Let me come up to speed. Let me get myself tuned up. That's what's holding them back. Just as we've also seen the rider come in and go, hey, we just tried a new pair of forks. I, I can't ride the bike to my ability because the bike is holding me back. But asking them, what is holding you back the most? That, that, that one right there, that's something, again, in my personal life, regular life off the track, I'm asking myself, what's holding me back the most from wanting to meet my goals? So. That, that is, a, that is, a, pretty, that, that is a, a really good one. Another thought on that one is, especially for engineers, something to think about. You guys are great on data. Fantastic, right? Data pretty much never lies as long as the data is pure. Uh, one thing to think about, stop negotiating with yourself. Stop negotiating with yourself. And what that simply means is look at the data, look at the facts, and act on it. We get too much chatter that's going on, too much things that are going on. And if you can stop negotiating with yourself, this is something that we find out with riders a lot, more on the mental side, is whether they're not good enough, they haven't trained enough, or whatever the issues are. And so riders, as we get them to say, look, let's look at our technical side of it, not our emotional side of it. If you take the emotion out and you work just on your technique, man, things, things absolutely start to happen that way. So you can ask yourself what's holding you back the most. And I think that that is a really great one that, that again, in your own, your own situations, you can look at. Managers, ask that to your, ask that to your employees. Ask that, ask that to the people in your group, right? What's holding you back the most? What can I do? What can I do to unblock that? What can I do to make your job better, situation better? Individual contributors, you can think about that as well, right? What's holding me back that I need to convey to my team so I can do a better job? of what's holding you back the most. Pick that one single thing and work on that. A couple things that I, couple things that I mentioned before um, is uh, you know, everybody here uh, comes at a pretty high level, uh, but we look at, look at things differently where we talk about professionals versus amateurs, right? Professionals, we all have goals, right? I mean, as professionals, we have goals. Amateurs, we have goals. The difference is professionals have processes to meet those goals. Right? Amateurs just have the goal. I hope I get there. hope that works. Right? So think about professionals. Right? Professionals have processes. Professionals are predictable when it comes to those things. So another thing, a couple things I want to just talk a little bit about was training versus practice. Realize that training and practice are two different things. Right? You train to learn something new. You practice your training. Right? You practice those situations to make it better. So. That's really about all I have to give you guys some good best practices. I know, of course, I talk too long. Sorry, Dan, works that way. Um, we can take some questions. If people have any questions on some of the things that I've talked about, I'm hoping that I gave you a little bit of something that you can think about, um, whether it's your motorcycle riders or whether it's part of your regular day. And again, you wanted some of the things that riders do, um, riders that, in a world-class environment, riders that are the best 
at what they do. These are the things that they look at every day in their life. Whether it's on the bike or off the bike, these are the types of habits they, they, they look at to get themselves um, to be the best there is. So hope you, uh, hope you all enjoyed it. If you've got questions, uh, I'll take them. This might be just specifically about bikes or not, but I just started tracking again and got a, a new vehicle. It was a 675R with Olin's yep. stock, everything. Yep. Should have been great. Got to the track. They almost didn't let me on tech inspection-wise because the front forks were too stiff. I think it scared them, they, and I went over to Evolution and had them look at it, et cetera, et cetera. But applying this, this fell outside of my competency. I didn't know what was wrong, and I don't know. Sometimes maybe in life or... This danger was something that if that guy had Did you buy the bike new? No, but it had 2,000 miles on it, one yeah. owner, and... So, I mean, this is a great... I mean, that's actually a great question. And, again, it absolutely works in the rest of your life, right? So, if you people that are engineers, things work in an envelope, right? There's an absolute operating envelope of how things work. Yeah. And a bike of that caliber, that's an amazing motorcycle. I've got a bunch of time on those bikes. They're a fantastic bike. But one of the things that you can do before you ride that bike is understand if you bought the bike new, you know it's history, right? It, you, you already know you can look at the manual and see where things are. Bikes that you don't know the history, I absolutely will spec them out. So find out where the bike is, find out who's been in there, find out where the bike is because it has so many different adjustments. The main thing is, is finding out where you're working at, where the bike is in its operating envelope. That's something that we work with, again, on a very high level with suspension engineers, data engineers, all the electronics that are on the bike, is as a rider starts to have a preference for something, we want to see if he's staying within the actual operating parameters of where the bike is, if bike is working the best. So in your case on yours, I'd get the bike spec'd out, find out where the bike is. And also the problem with that is feel means nothing. I mean, if you bounce on the bike, I mean, you can have some ideas of it, but for the most part, until you see the operating, until you know where the parameters of the bike are, until you've spec'd it out, I wouldn't make that call um, because bikes feel, if you, if you look at my personal bike, the forks feel really soft, the back is a brick, the back is super stiff. So somebody would look at that and go, oh my God, it's not rideable, but in fact, it is very, very rideable. So yeah, get it spec'd out. So specifically, not a lot of suspension shops I mean, who do you go to to find out if a track bike suspension is okay in this area? Ken Moss might be. Dave Moss, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, so again, I, I want, so part of what I've, I've worked on in all of my life um, is I want to do what the best riders in the world are doing, right? Because if there's a better way, they would do it. Pretty simple, right? So realize that the um, person that I'm going to ask is somebody that has operated at that highest level. I use Mike Canfield in Sacramento. Uh, and I do just because he's four-time Moto America crew chief, and uh, he's got his own suspension shop there. So I'll use somebody like him because, that, I mean, I want to work with somebody that has operated at the very highest levels, so because they understand. Something we also we talk about, right? If you want the last one percent, it has to come from somebody that understands the last one percent. Where in your case, that. That may be your last 1%. may not be his last 1%, but he's still at a point where he can understand it. So does that make sense? OK, good. What other questions? Hi. Um, I'm not a writer, but I'm, this is more of like a question for uh, pertains to sport and training and all that. If, like, if you're trying to get to the next level or training for a, I don't know, a new technique, or specifically, say in writing, where there's very little room for error, how do you make that progress and not have like a really, really bad consequence? Yeah. So we talk about how we how we build new fundamentals, and honestly, or, or when we're looking at it from a risk standpoint, because riding a motorcycle, of course, can be very risky, and it's like, dude, Scott, yeah, just go in there and send the thing in there, you'll be fine. It doesn't work that way. So we work on, we work on taking things um, at a very precise and deliberate um, uh, stepping level. So for instance, if we have a rider that um, uh, we want him to break later into a corner, because getting in a corner and breaking later is probably the scariest thing on a motorcycle, uh, and your fear factor takes over, um, is instead of saying, hey, look, you need to go to the brakes 200 feet later, how about you go to the brakes 10 feet later, and then you work up to it. 
So it's just like in different sports. Um, cycling is the same way for me. So as a cyclist, fairly competitive cyclist, um, when in my training, we would train with power. Uh, it's the same thing, right? If I want a certain power increase, I'm just not gonna expect a huge increase. Instead, I'll build my training incrementally to be able to get there. And of course, you gotta have good data to be able to support that as well and have pure data to be able to make that happen. So we'll look at things um, and, and step them up. But again, you have to put yourself in a position to be able to adjust for it as well. So this goes all back to all of your initial inputs have got to be smooth so we can have that clear data. Also, being able to record that data is a, is a pretty big deal as well. We do a lot of work with video. Video work works um, good for us, but we also do a lot of data acquisition work as well. And then I was using the cycling analogy, same thing. We use a lot of um, data on cycling to, to track power levels. So when we're building a new habit or a new fundamental, one, we work on one thing at a time, right? Because if you want 100% result from something, you work on one thing at a time uh, instead of working on 10 different things at 10%. So we'll spend a massive amount of time um, working on that one very single thing. I have a rider, for instance. Um, actually, I'll give you two examples. I have a rider uh, that we worked on their initial brake control for probably six months just on how he went to the brakes. And not only would we practice it on the bike, but we'd practice it in his car. So even if he's working on the motorcycle, I need the brain, I need the electrical connection in his brain to not be aggressive with his inputs. So how we drove his car, I'd be very deliberate on how we went to the brakes. And that really sped, the, sped that process up. Another way of shortcutting that process is exactly what I said. Whether, whatever your sport is, Whatever that habit is, you can work on it um, uh, off of it. I mentioned yoga. So one of the things that I work on in yoga is I work on the first 5% of my pose. Because one, being a dumb male, right, I typically do things way too aggressively. And we, if I do things, um, if I notice that I got into a pose too quickly, I'd fall out of the pose earlier. But if I got into the pose, first 5% of my pose was slower, I could almost always hold the pose the whole minute. So, it's putting all these things in your brain that, again, how you do anything is how you do everything. So big, a big, good thought for you there. What else? Any recommended reading? Yeah, um, you know, with, with the reading, I don't, I don't have anything um, reading-wise that I do. I mean, I, I read a lot of books on just uh, essentially just basic psychology, things, things along those lines, just how, how brains work. And, um, but other than I don't really have any recommended reading other than doing what the best in the world are doing. So I, I spend a lot of, like the fighter pilot stuff. There's a lot of stuff on how the fighter pilots look at things. Um, even the special forces guys, I look at a lot of that type of uh, reading and the psychology that goes behind it. All right, thanks everyone for coming, appreciate it. Good.